Continuing our discussion on the fluid mosaic model to represent cell membranes, we now understand what makes the fluid mosaic model or mosaic model fluid. It's this idea of it's being determined by temperature, fatty acid saturation, chain length, and most importantly, of course, cholesterol. Now we're going to look at this part of this word, uh, this phrase, a fluid mosaic model. What is the mosaic portion? What is the mosaic portion? I'll just say either or from this point forward. So let's define it. Let's figure out what this is all about. And I'm just going to drag this down a little bit further. So what is the mosaic portion of the fluid mosaic model? This part of the model specifically is dedicated to proteins. The cell membrane is not just a phospholipid bilayer. It actually contains proteins, and these proteins are all amphipathic in nature. AMP will stand for amphipathic. And we remember that amphipathic means that it has both polar and nonpolar components. And this is a really, really interesting part of the fluid mosaic model, that we have these proteins that the, have the ability to be a part of a both hydrophobic and hydrophilic structure. We'll talk about that in just a second. So, we want to look at a couple of different types of proteins specifically. So let's look at the types. Many different proteins are found on the cell membrane and that create this mosaic pattern. Um, if you know what a mosaic is, it's just a pattern of many different sorts combined together to give you a nice image. There are many different proteins creating this mosaic model. And these proteins fall under the types. A couple of different types. The first type that we'll look at um, are peripheral proteins. If you guys already know, peripheral just means you know your periphery is the side vision. Peripheral proteins on the um, cell membrane, at least, are proteins that are not embedded on surface. So that's their basic definition. They're not embedded on surface. Um, actually, they're just not embedded. So let's write that down. Just not embedded. But what I basically mean by this is that if we draw a cell membrane very, very quickly here, this protein, this peripheral protein, will not be embedded. And by that, I mean it's not going to be anywhere in here. It's not going to be in this area of the cell membrane. Instead, it's going to be on the surface of the cell membrane, right over here, in this area. And that's what I mean by not embedded, but actually, instead, it's found on the surface. All right, on surface instead. And because it's on the surface, what do you expect its sort of, let's say, hydrophobicity or felicity to be? Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Of course, it's next to hydrophilic heads, so it's going to be a hydrophilic protein for the most part. So these proteins that are peripheral are also hydrophilic. So these are things you just need to know. So that's one type of protein. Another type of protein that you need to know is integral. Integral proteins. Integral proteins are actually deeply inserted into the membrane. They are over here in this part of the membrane. And that will tell you, you should have an idea of what that means in terms of its relationship to water. So they're deeply inserted into membrane, running out of space, but it's all right, inserted um, into, deeply inserted into MEM membrane. In addition to this, they actually may um, span across the membrane also, may span membrane and when they go all across the membrane, all across the entire cell, they're now referred to as transmembrane proteins. So transmembrane proteins are a type of integral proteins, which are a type of protein found on the mosaic model of cell membranes. In addition to that, internally, these guys are going to be hydrophobic in nature because guess what? They're found in, at the hydrophobic tail, so they themselves are going to be hydrophobic. 
they are hydrophobic proteins because they interact with hydrophobic regions of the cell membrane. Simple enough. And lastly, they're basically the spacers of the cell membrane. They create some space between tails, the hydrophobic tails, so that there are sort of kinks and portions of the cell membrane that are separated from each other. The last part about proteins that you want to understand is this idea that they actually form patterns. And this is what we mean by the mosaic model. Form patterns, and that basically literally tells us what that mosaic term is all about. Oops. That mosaic term refers to these patterns. The proteins make these patterns. Some are actually held in place, let's say. So how can I define these patterns? Well, some proteins are held in place. They don't move around. They are specifically at a certain spot and stay at that certain spot. But others actually can move, and they can move laterally specifically. Others can move laterally. And if you don't know what laterally means, it means that they can move side to side on the cell membrane. They have all of the ability to go around the cell membrane in this way. Around and around and around, however they want. But what we have to remember is that because they have this ability to go and go transmembrane all across the membrane, circle around it, side to side, laterally, what you have to have to remember is that they cannot flip-flop. Can't flip-flop. What do I mean by that? If I have a protein here, let's say this is my protein, this square right here is my protein, it cannot go up and down. It cannot jump. And do you know why? That's because if it jumps, it now leaves the hydrophobic region. It's no longer integral. And if it's no longer integral, that means it is on a side which it doesn't like at all. It's on the hydrophilic heads, so it can't do this. Just chemically speaking, it's not a favorable interaction for these proteins to go up and down, up and down, up and down. Instead, it's good for them to go side to side. That's all that means there. So what we have to imagine simply is that when we have, so you might be asking, can the peripheral proteins then transfer themselves across that um, hydrophilic part of the cell membrane? Yeah, they can of course do that. So a good way to sort of represent this is if we imagine the cell membrane as sort of a philic side of the cell membrane, and we also imagine the cell membrane as a phobic side, and obviously when I talk about this, I'm talking about water separated, let's say, like this. This is a cell membrane. You have hydrophilic heads on the top, and you have hydrophobic tails on the bottom. What you can remember is that movement can only happen laterally on both ends. What is never going to happen? You're never, ever going to have movement going up and down. This never, ever, ever happens because it violates chemical laws of hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. So overall, this gives us an idea of where the mosaic portion of the fluid mosaic model comes from. Simply speaking, it's due to the proteins. These proteins are amphipathic in nature. They have the ability to be peripheral or integral depending on their phobicity, depending on their relationship to water, depending on their location on the cell membrane, and that location forms a pattern. And that pattern is held in place sometimes, but also has the ability to change so long as you follow the rule of only going side to side because that maintains chemical integrity, let's say. So this gives us a much better idea of where the mosaic portion of the fluid mosaic model comes from. And now we understand what the fluid mosaic model really is and how it's defined in terms of fluidity and pattern, mosaic uh, model ability, let's say. So in our next video, we'll be finishing up the structure of membranes by talking about carbohydrates in general, and also we'll just touch upon the basic functions of cell membranes.